lace-up shoes. It's been a long time, Hansu said calmly, entering the restaurant. Sanja stepped several paces away from him. What are you doing here? This is my restaurant. Kim Chang-ho works for me. Her head felt foggy, and Sanja slumped down on the nearest seat cushion. Hansu had located her 11 years ago when she'd pawned the silver pocket watch he'd given her. The pawnbroker had tried to sell him that watch, and the rest had been simple detective work. Since then, Hansu had been tracking her daily. After Isak went to prison, he knew she needed money and created this job for her. Sanja learned that the money lender, who'd loaned Yosef the money, worked for him as well. In fact, Hansu's wife was the eldest daughter of a powerful Japanese money lender in Kansai, and Hansu had been legally adopted by his father-in-law, Morimoto, because the man did not have a son. Ko Hansu, whose legal name was Haru Morimoto, lived in an enormous house outside of Osaka with his wife and three daughters. Hansu led her back to the table where she'd sat only a few moments ago with Kim and kyung -hee. Let's have some tea. You stay here, I'll get a cup. You seem troubled by my appearance. Familiar with where everything was, Hansu returned from the kitchen right away with the teacup. Sanja stared at him, still unable to speak. Noah is a very smart boy, he said proudly. He's a handsome child and an excellent runner. She tried not to look afraid. How did he know these things? She now recalled every conversation she'd ever had with Kim about her sons. There had been numerous occasions when Noah and Mozazu had been with her at the restaurant when there had been no school for Noah. What do you want? She asked finally, trying to appear calmer than she felt. You have to leave Osaka immediately. Convince your sister and your brother-in-law to go for the safety of the children. However, if they don't want to go, there's little you can do. I have a place for you and the boys. Why? Because the real bombing will start soon here. What are you talking about? The Americans are going to bomb Osaka in a matter of days. The B-29s have been in China. Now they found more bases on the islands. The Japanese are losing the war. The government knows it can never win, but won't admit it. The Americans know that the Japanese military has to be stopped. The Japanese military would kill every Japanese boy rather than admit its error. Fortunately, the war will end before Noah is recruited. But everyone says Japan is doing better. You mustn't believe what you hear from the neighbors or what the newspapers say. They don't know. Shh. Sanja looked around instinctively at the plate glass window in the front door. If anyone was caught saying such treacherous things, he could be sent to jail. She had repeatedly told her boys to never, ever say anything negative about Japan or the war. You shouldn't talk like this. You could get in trouble. No one can hear us. She bit her lower lip and stared, still unable to believe the sight of him. It had been... 12 years. Yet here was the same face, the one she had loved so much. She had loved his face the way he had loved the brightness of the moon and the cold blue water of the sea. Hansu was sitting across from her, and he returned her gaze, looking kindly at her. However, he remained composed, certain of every measured word he uttered. There had never been any hesitation in him, he was unlike her father, Isak, her brother-in-law, or Kim. He was unlike any other man she had ever known. Sanjaya, you have to leave Osaka. There's no time to think about it. I came here to tell you this because the bombs will destroy this city. Why had he not come sooner? Why had he kept back like a watchful shadow over her life? How many times had he seen her? when she had not seen him. The anger she felt toward him surprised her. They won't leave, and I can't just... You mean your brother-in-law. He might be a fool, 
But that's not your problem. The sister-in-law will go if you tell her. This city is made of wood and paper. It'll take no more than a match for it to incinerate. Imagine what will happen with an American bomb. He paused. Your sons will be killed. Is that what you want? I've already sent my daughters away a long time ago. A parent must be decisive. A child cannot protect himself. She understood then. Hansu was worried about Noah. He had a Japanese wife and three daughters. He had no son. How do you know? How do you know what will happen? How did I know that you needed work? How did I know where Noah goes to school? That his math teacher is a Korean who pretends to be Japanese. That your husband died because he didn't get out of prison in time and that you're alone in this world. How did I know how to keep my family safe? It's my job to know what others don't. How did you know to make kimchi and sell it on the street corner to earn money? You knew because you wanted to live. I want to live too. And if I want to live, I have to know things others don't. Now I'm telling you something valuable. I'm telling you something so you can save your son's lives. Don't waste this information. The world can go to hell, but you need to protect your sons. My brother-in-law will not abandon his house. He laughed. The house will be a pile of ashes. The Japanese will not give him a sen for his pain when it's gone. The neighbors said that the war will end soon. The war will end soon, but not the way they think. The wealthy Japanese have already sent their families to the country. They've already converted their cash into gold. The rich do not care about politics. They will say anything to save their skin. You're not rich, but you're smart. And I'm telling you that you have to leave today. How? Kim will take you, your brother-in-law and sister-in-law, and the boys to a farm outside Osaka Prefecture. A sweet potato farmer owes me a favor. He has a big place, and there'll be plenty of food there. All of you will have to work for him until the war's over. But you'll have a place to sleep and more than enough to eat. Tamaguchi-san has no children. He won't harm you. Why did you come? Sanja began to cry. It's not the time to discuss this. Please don't be a foolish woman. You're smarter than that. It's time to take action. The restaurant will be destroyed no different than your house will be, he said, speaking quickly. This building is made of wood and a few bricks. Your brother-in-law should sell his house immediately to the next idiot and get out. Or at the very least, he should take his ownership papers with him. Soon, people will be fleeing here like rats, so you have to leave now before it's too late. The Americans will finish this stupid war. Maybe tonight, maybe in a few weeks, but they're not going to put up with this nonsense war for very long. The Germans are losing too. Sanja folded her hands together. The war had been going on for so long, everyone was sick of it. Without the restaurant, the family would have starved, even though everyone was working and earning money. Their clothes were threadbare and holy. Cloth, thread, and needles were unavailable. How were Hansu's shoes so shiny when no one had any shoe polish? She and Kyunki loathed the neighborhood association's endless meetings. Yet if they didn't go, the leaders would take it out on their rations. The latest military drills had become ludicrous. On Sunday mornings, grandmothers and little children were required to practice spearing the enemy with sharpened bamboo spears. They said American soldiers raped women and girls, and that it would be better to kill yourself than to surrender to such barbarians. Back in the restaurant office, there was a cache of bamboo spears for the workers and the customers in case the Americans landed. Kim kept two hunting knives in his desk drawer. Can I go back home to Busan? There's nothing to eat there, and it isn't safe for you. Women are being taken away from smaller villages in greater numbers. Sanja looked puzzled. I've told you this before. Never listen to anyone who tells you there's good factory work in China or any of the other colonies. 
those jobs don't exist. Do you understand me? His expression grew severe. Is my mother all right? She's not young, so they won't take her. I'll try to find out. Thank you, she said quietly. Worried about her boys, Sanja hadn't paid enough attention to her mother's welfare. In Yang Jin's sparse letters, written for her by a harried school teacher, she'd say that she was fine, expressing more concern for Sanja and the boys than for herself. Sanja hadn't seen her mother in as many years as she had not seen Hansu. Can you be ready to go tonight? Why would my brother-in-law listen to me? How can I possibly explain? Tell him that Kim told you that you must leave today. He's talking to your sister-in-law now. Tell him that he learned this privileged information from his boss. I can send Kim to speak to him at your house. Sanja said nothing. She didn't believe that anyone could convince Yosef to leave. There should be no hesitation. The boys have to be protected. But sister will. So what about her? Listen to me. Choose your sons over everyone else. Don't you know this by now? She nodded. Bring everyone here at dusk. Kim will keep the restaurant open. No one should know where you're going. You want to get out of here before everyone else tries to as well. Hansu got up and looked at her soberly. Leave the others if you have to. Chapter 7, 1945 on the day that Hansu told her to take the boys to the country, Yosef got a job offer. Earlier that afternoon, a friend of a friend had stopped by Yosef's biscuit factory and told him of the position. A steel factory in Nagasaki needed a foreman to manage its Korean workers. There would be a housing camp for men, including room and board, but Yosef couldn't bring his family. The pay was almost triple his current salary. The family would be separated for a while. When Yosef came home, excited about the offer, Kyanghi and Sanja had news of their own. Hansu's hand was in everything. But what could Sanja say? At dusk, Kim moved the women and boys to Tamaguchi's farm. The next morning, Yosef quit his job at the factory, packed one bag, and locked up the house. That afternoon, Yosef headed to Nagasaki recalling the time he left Pyongyang for Osaka, the last time he'd left on a journey by himself. Short months passed before the bombing started, but once they began, the bombing continued through the summer. Hansu was wrong about the timing, but he was right that the neighborhood would turn to ashes. Tamaguchi, a 58-year-old sweet potato farmer, did not mind having the extra pairs of hands. His regular workers, and seasonal ones, had been conscripted years ago, and there were no able-bodied men to replace them. Several of his former workers had already died in Manchuria, with two badly disabled in battle, and there had been scant news of the others sent to Singapore and the Philippines. Each morning, as Tamaguchi rose from his futon, he suffered from the routine aches that accompanied aging. However, he was relieved to be old, since he would not have to fight the stupid war. The shortage of men impaired his ambitions for his farm, especially at a time when there was a growing demand for potatoes. Tamaguchi could command any illegal price he wanted, it seemed. And now that he had tasted wealth, so much so that he'd been forced to hide troves of treasure in various parts of the farm, he was willing to do whatever it took to squeeze every golden drop from this national calamity. Night and day, Tamaguchi cultivated potato slips, turned the earth, and planted. Without men, it was nearly impossible to complete the endless chores of the farm. And without men, there was no one to marry his wife's two sisters, whom he'd been forced to take in. Worthless city girls, not built for any kind of work. With their chatter and made-up ailments, the sisters distracted his wife from her labors, and he hoped he wouldn't be saddled with them for much longer. Thankfully, his wife's parents were dead. 
or seasonal work, Tamaguchi had been hiring the elderly men and women in the village. But they were given to endless whining about the difficult nature of planting in the warm weather and harvesting in the cold. It would never have occurred to Tamaguchi to hire city Koreans or to bore them on his farm when he'd turned away many city Japanese who'd sought refuge. But Ko Hansu, he could not refuse. Upon the receipt of Hansu's telegram, the farmer and his overworked wife, Hyoko, configured the barn to make it habitable for the Korean family from Osaka. Only days after their arrival, however, Tamaguchi learned that it was he who'd got the better end of the bargain. Hansu had furnished him with two strong women who could cook, clean, and plow. A young man who couldn't see well, but could dig and lift. And two clever boys who took instructions perfectly. The Koreans ate plenty, but they earned their keep and bothered no one. They didn't ever complain. From the first day, Tamaguchi put Noah and Mozazu in charge of feeding the three cows, eight pigs, and 30 chickens, milking the cows, collecting the eggs, and cleaning the hen house. The boys spoke Japanese like natives, so he was able to take them to the market to help sell. The older one was excellent with calculations, and his letters were neat enough for the ledger. The two Korean women, sisters-in-law, were fine housekeepers and hardy outdoor workers. The skinny married one was not young, but very pretty. And her Japanese was good enough that Kyoko tasked her with the cooking, washing, and mending. The shorter one, the quiet widow, tended the kitchen garden ably and worked in the fields alongside the young man. The two labored like a pair of oxen. For the first time in years, Tamaguchi felt relaxed. Even his wife was less irritable, scolding him and her sisters less than usual. Four months after their arrival, Hansu's truck drove up to the farm at dusk. Hansu stepped out of the truck, and he had with him an older Korean woman. Tamaguchi rushed to meet him. Normally, Hansu's men came by in the evenings to pick up the produce for sale in the city, but it was rarely the boss himself. Tamaguchi-san, Hansu bowed. The old woman bowed to Tamaguchi from the waist. She wore a traditional dress, and in each hand, she clutched fabric parcels. Oh, son. Tamaguchi bowed, smiling at the older woman. As he drew closer, Tamaguchi could see that the woman was not very old. In fact, she might have been younger than he was. Her brown face was drawn and malnourished. This is Sanja's mother, Kim Yongjin Desu, Hansu said. She arrived from Busan earlier today. Kim Mu... Young Jin Sun. The farmer said each syllable slowly, realizing that he had a new guest. He scanned her face, searching for any resemblance to the young widow, mother of the two boys. There was some similarity around the mouth and jaw. The woman's brown hands were strong like a man's, with large, knobbed fingers. She would make a good worker, he thought. Sanjo's mother! Is that so? Welcome, welcome, he said, smiling. Young Jin, her eyes downcast, appeared afraid. She was also exhausted. Hansu cleared his throat. And how are the boys? I hope they're not giving you any trouble. No, no, not at all. They're excellent workers, wonderful boys. Tamaguchi meant this. He had not expected the boys to be so capable. With no children of his own, he had expected city children to be spoiled and lazy, like his sisters-in-law. In his village, prosperous farmers complained about their foolish sons, so the childless Tamaguchi and his wife had not envied parents very much. Also, Tamaguchi hadn't had any idea of what Koreans would be like. He was not a bigoted man, but the only Korean he knew personally was Ko Hansu and their relationship had begun with the war and was not an ordinary one. An open secret, several of the larger farms sold their produce on the city's black markets through Kohansu and his distribution network. 
but no one discussed this. Foreigners and Yakuza controlled the black market, and there were serious repercussions for selling produce to them. It was an honor to help Kohansu. Favors created obligations, and the farmer was determined to do anything he could for him. Kosan, please come inside the house for tea. You must be thirsty. It is very hot today. Tamaguchi walked into the house, and even before taking off his own shoes, the farmer offered house slippers to his guests. Shaded by ancient, sturdy poplars, the interior of the large farmhouse was pleasantly cool. The fresh grass smell of new tatami mats greeted the guests. In the main room, paneled in cedar, Tamaguchi's wife, Hyoko, sat on a blue silk floor cushion, sewing her husband's shirt. Her two sisters, lying on their stomachs with their ankles crossed, flipped through an old movie magazine they'd read so many times before that they'd memorized its text. The three women, exceptionally well-dressed, for no one in particular, looked out of place in the farmhouse. Despite the rationing of cloth, the farmer's wife and her sisters had not suffered any privation. Kyoko wore an elegant cotton kimono, more suited for a Tokyo merchant's wife, and the sisters wore smart navy skirts and cotton blouses, looking like college coeds from American films. When the sisters lifted their chins to see who'd walked into the house, their pale, pretty faces emerged from the long bangs of their stylishly bobbed haircuts. The war had brought priceless treasures to the Tamaguchi home. Valuable calligraphy scrolls, bolts of fabric, more kimonos than the women could ever wear, lacquered cupboards, jewels and dishes, possessions of city dwellers who'd been willing to trade heirlooms for a sack of potatoes and a chicken. However, the sisters yearned for the city itself. New films, Kansai shops, the unblinking electric lights. They were sick of the war, the endless green fields, and farm life in general. Bellies full and well housed, they had only contempt for the smell of lamp oil, loud animals, and their hick brother-in-law, who was always talking about the prices of things. The American bombs had burned down the cinemas, department stores, and their beloved confectionaries. But glittering images of such urban pleasures called to them still, feeding their growing discontent. They complained daily to their elder sister, the plain and sacrificial one, whom they had once mocked for marrying their distant country cousin, who now prepared gold and kimonos for their dowries. When Tamaguchi cleared his throat, the girl sat up and tried to look busy. They nodded at Hansu and stared at the filthy hem of the Korean woman's long skirt, unable to keep from making a face. Yongjin bowed deeply to the three women and remained by the door, not expecting to be invited in, and she was not. From where she stood, Yongjin could see a portion of the bent back of a woman working in the kitchen, but it didn't look like Sanja. Hansu spotted the woman in the kitchen as well and asked Tamaguchi's wife, Is that Sanja-san in the kitchen? Kyoko bowed to him again. The Korean seemed too confident for her taste, but she recognized that her husband needed the fellow more than ever. Kosan, welcome. It's so nice to see you. Kyoko said, rising from her seat. She gave her sisters a reproving look, which stirred them sufficiently to stand up and bow to the guest. The woman in the kitchen is Kyunghee san Sanja-san is planting in the fields. Please, sit down. We shall get you something cool to drink. She turned to Umechan, the younger of the two sisters, and Ume trudged to the kitchen to fetch cold oolong cha. Hansu nodded trying not to show his irritation. He'd expected Sanja to work, but it hadn't occurred to him that she'd be doing outdoor labor. Kyoko sensed the man's displeasure. Surely you must want to see your daughter, ma'am. Tako chan please accompany our guest to her daughter. Tako, the middle of the three sisters, complied because she had no choice. It was pointless to defy Kyoko who could hold a grudge for days in punitive silence. 
Hansu told Young Jin in Korean to follow the girl who would take her to Sanja. As Taco put on her shoes in the stone paved foyer, she caught a whiff of the old woman's sour, peculiar odor, only aggravated by two days of travel. Filthy, she thought. Taco walked briskly ahead of her, keeping as many paces between them as she could. After Kyoko poured the tea that Ume had brought from the kitchen, the women disappeared, leaving the men to speak alone in the living room. The farmer asked Hansu for news of the war. It can't last much longer. The Germans are being crushed, and the Americans are just getting started. Japan will lose this war. It's a matter of when. Hansu said this without a trace of regret or joy. It's better to stop this madness sooner than later than to have more nice boys get killed, is it not? Yes, yes. That is so, isn't it? Tamaguchi replied in a whisper, dispirited. Of course he wanted Japan to win, and no doubt Hansu knew the realities. But even if Japan would not win, the farmer had no wish for the war to end just yet. There had been talk of fermenting sweet potatoes into airplane fuel. If that happened, and even if the government paid only a little, if anything at all, the farmer expected prices to rise even higher on the black market because the cities were desperate for food and alcohol. With just one or two more harvests, Tamaguchi would have enough gold to buy the two vast tracts of land beside his. The owner of the plots was only getting older and less interested in working. To own the entire south side of the region in one unbroken lot had been his grandfather's dearest wish. Hansu interrupted the farmer's reverie. So, how is it having them here? Tamaguchi nodded favorably. They help a great deal. I wish they didn't have to work so much, but as you know, I'm short on men. They'd expected to work. Hansu nodded reassuringly, fully cognizant that the farmer was getting back his room and board and making a large profit. But this was okay with him, as long as Sanja and her family weren't being mistreated. Will you stay with us tonight? Tamaguchi asked. It's too late to travel, and you must have dinner with us. kyunghee san is an exceptional cook. Taco didn't have to walk the old woman far. When Young Jin spotted her daughter bent over in the vast, dark field, she grabbed the tail end of her long skirt and wound it around her body to free her legs. She ran as fast as she could in the direction of her daughter. Sunja, who heard the rushed footfalls, looked up from her planting. A tiny woman in an off-white colored hanbok was running toward her, and Sunja dropped her hoe. The small shoulders, the gray bun gathered at the base of the neck, the bow of the short blouse knotted neatly in a soft rectangle. Oh, ma, how was that possible? Sanja trampled the potato slips in her path to get to her. Oh, my child, my child. Oh, my child. Sanja held her mother close, able to feel the sharpness of Yang Jin's collarbone beneath the blouse fabric. Her mother had shrunk. Hansu ate his dinner quickly, then went to the barn to speak with the others. He wanted merely to sit with them, not to have them fuss over him. He would have preferred to eat with Sanja and her family, but he didn't want to offend Tamaguchi. During the meal, he had thought only of her and the boy. They had never shared a meal. It was hard to explain, even to himself, his yearning to be with them. In the barn, he realized that Kyunghee had made two dinners in the Tamaguchi kitchen, a Japanese one for the Tamaguchi family and a Korean for the others. In the barn, the Koreans ate their meals on a low, oilcloth-covered table that Kim had built for them with leftover beans. Sanja had just cleared the dinner dishes. Everyone looked up when he walked in. The animals were quieter in the evening, but they were not silent. The smells were stronger than Hansu remembered, 
but he knew the odor would be less noticeable soon enough. The Koreans were housed in the back part of the barn, and the animals were nearer the front, with haystacks between them. Kim had built a wooden partition, and he and the boy slept on one side, with the women on the other. Young Jin, who'd been sitting on the ground between her grandsons, got up and bowed to him. On the way to the farm, she'd thanked him numerous times, and now, reunited with her family, she kept repeating, thank you, thank you, clutching onto her grandsons, who looked embarrassed. She bawled like an old Korean woman. Kyung Hee was still in the farmhouse kitchen, washing the dinner dishes. When she finished with that, she would prepare the guest room for Hansu. Kim was in the shed behind the barn that was used for bathing, busy heating water for everyone's bath. Kyung Hee and Kim had taken over Sunja's evening chores to allow her to remain with her mother. None of them suspected the reasons why Hansu had gone through the trouble of getting Yongjin from Korea. As Yongjin sobbed, Sanja observed Hansu, unable to make sense of this man who had never left her life. Hansu sat down on the thick pile of hay opposite the boys. Did you eat enough dinner? Hansu asked them in plain Korean. The boys looked up, surprised that Hansu spoke Korean so well. They'd thought that the man who'd brought their grandmother might be Japanese, because he was so well-dressed, and since Tamaguchi-san had treated him with such deference. You are Noah, Hansu said, considering the boy's face carefully. You are twelve years old. Yes, sir, Noah replied. The man wore very fine clothes and beautiful leather shoes. He looked like a judge or an important person in a movie poster. How do you like being on the farm? It is good, sir. I'm almost six years old, Mozazu interrupted, something he did out of habit whenever his older brother spoke. We eat a lot of rice here. I can eat bowls and bowls of rice. Tamaguchi-san said that I need to eat well to grow. He told me not to eat potatoes, but to eat rice. Do you like rice, sir? The boy asked Hansu. Noah and I will have baths tonight. In Osaka, we couldn't take baths often because there was no fuel for hot water. I like the baths on the farm better because the tub is smaller than the one at the Sento. Do you like baths? The water is so hot, but you get used to it, eh? And the tips of my fingers get wrinkled like an old man when I don't come out of the water. Muzazu opened his eyes wide. My face doesn't wrinkle, though, because I am young. Hansu laughed. The younger child had none of Noah's formality. He seemed so free. I'm glad you're eating well here. That's good to know. Tamaguchi-san said that you boys are excellent workers. Thank you, sir, Mozazu said, wanting to ask the man more questions, but stopping himself 